Well, this morning, the title of the message is going to be Armor Up. Armor Up. Yep. And Armor Up for a battle that you might not even know that you're in. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, but I got to be honest, I woke up. So last week, I don't know if you've ever uh, really been grinding away at something and you, you had a goal and everything was focused on it and it was just really intense and you're putting a lot of time and effort and energy and all of a sudden, you know, it may have even taken you a really long time to get there and all of a sudden you get there and you have this big crescendo moment and it's like, wow, it was amazing. It was draining. It was physically draining. It was spiritually draining. It was mentally draining. And then all of a sudden you get to the next day and I had that moment last week where you're in Holy Week and it's building up and you're really in the word and you're learning about everything that Holy Week represents. And then you have that moment with, uh, another, with a group of believers on Friday night over at our house to watch the Passion. And you see what our Lord and Savior did for us on the cross. And the, the deeper you get in your relationship with the Lord, I think the more intense it is as you watch that, as you really appreciate what he's done for you. And then you also had other believers around you that maybe hadn't seen that yet, and you see the impact that it's having on them. And then all of a sudden, Saturday comes, and, and then Sunday, and, and you got Resurrection Sunday, and you're excited to preach and tell everybody what that represents. And so it was just an emotionally, physically, and spiritually draining week. And so on Monday morning, like all good preachers would do, I'm sitting there sulking at the kitchen table, and I have no idea why I'm doing that. I have no idea what's going on and why I'm allowing myself to do that. But my beautiful, amazing, spirit-filled wife walks by. And she's walking. And she just stops. And she looks at me. She's like, what's, what's wrong with you? Are you depressed or something? Like, what are, you, what are you doing? And I just look at her, you know, basically not in a very good mood. Don't really want anybody to talk to me. And she's like, go do something. Go do something. <laughs> I, was, I thought, okay, that's a good idea. I probably should not just sit here and sulk. And so I went and I went downstairs and I worked out for an hour and I listened to a message. And an hour later, I was a completely different human being. Imagine that. And so I got thinking about this and I'm going to backtrack a little bit because that was the end of the story a little bit. But on Sunday night, as you're kind of coming down from this high, and you had all these things going on and family get togethers, amazing service, baptism service, which was unbelievable. And then, like I said, you had that whole week leading up. And so I went to bed though, and I started thinking, all right, Lord, and just so you know, those that come to Rooted Right, this is where I'm at as a, as a pastor, as a minister right now. Every week I ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to preach to your people? I know that you're an on-time God. So I know you're gonna hear people that you listen to that they've been planning for six months what they're gonna preach, and that's wonderful. Maybe that's something that happens when you're a seasoned veteran preacher, but I literally am saying every week, Lord, what do you want me to preach? And so I woke up, and again, I'm not doing this to impress anybody. What I want to encourage you is that you can hear from the Holy Spirit. You really can. And this is how the Lord confirms these things many times. So I woke up on Monday morning, and I had been praying before I went to bed, and then on, on Monday morning, Lord, what would you want me to preach this week? And so all in my spirit, all morning before I even got into the depressed stage, um, I, I was feeling like armor of God. I've never been able to preach on the armor of God. We went through with the men both on Thursday and Friday morning. It's been amazing. There's been talk about it. I've certainly brought it up in sermons plenty of times, but we haven't really preached on the armor of God. And I'm, I'm realizing more and more why he put that on my heart. But let me just tell you how this goes. I don't have any connection to you version. The Bible app, for those of you who do, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I don't like have, I'm not in the know. I don't have, know what's coming up tomorrow or the next day. And so after that depression thing, and I decided, well, maybe I should actually go do the verse of the day. And I click on the verse of the day, and guess what the verse of the day is? Oh, they're going to do the armor of God. Oh, imagine that. And then after I got done with my workout and I was in a much better mood, I got into my car and I put on 102.5, the talk station. They have two different ones the talk station, and the first message that comes on, guess what it is? The armor of God. Amazing, right? Then I go to Thursday morning. Nobody knows this, so that's confirmation. I'm like, Lord, you're just so awesome. Of course, that's what I'm going to do this week. I go to Thursday morning with the men, and we're going around. We're giving praise reports and prayer requests, and we get to Bob, 
who's Bob and Laura oversees the children's ministry. Bob has no idea what I've been thinking about all week. And of course, yes, he does the, the verse of the day, but that doesn't mean for sure that's what you're going to do with the children's ministry. But they just got done and he was thinking, Lord, what am I going to do? And he starts sharing. He was really praying about it. And the Lord really impressed upon his heart to do the armor of God with the children's ministry. And I just looked at Bobby sitting next to me before I got to go after him. And imagine that, the armor of God. And so that you may be thinking, well, that's nice, Andy. That's great that you're hearing from the Lord. But what about me? Well, the steps of a good man and woman are ordered by the Lord, and you're here for a reason. I truly believe we serve an on-time God, and there's a reason. There, you could preach millions of messages. There's tons of messages to preach. You could just pick one out of a hat if you want to, but that's not how it goes. The Spirit is moving, and we serve an on-time God, and there's a reason we need this. And I wonder if even after last week, hearing what Jesus did for you on the cross, hearing what you have access to with his resurrection and a new life that you have access to. I wonder, as we talk about all the time, if you realize that the enemy wants to steal that immediately. So there is me Monday morning sitting there sulking, all the things that could have been done differently, all the people that I wish that were there, all the things that you lecture yourself to, to, to sit there and think and contemplate over and over and over again, things you wish you would have said, things you wish you would have done different, right? And you just start making up all these things in your mind. You allow the enemy just to mess with you. So what are we going to do this morning? We're going to learn how to not let the enemy steal the growth that happens right in here every single week. The growth that happens by like-minded believers coming together and diving into the word. I've told you many times the enemy tries to steal it by the time you get to the car. He tries to forfeit it. I'm going to start like this. Have you ever been overdressed or underdressed for an occasion? You, you thought it was going to be one way. Maybe you thought you had a, a, you know, some fancy thing that you were going to, and you show up looking all good, and everybody shows up in their shorts and flip-flops and hats, and you go, whoa, I, 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 missed, I missed the message. Have you ever worn the wrong thing? I know that uh, a couple years ago, uh, my nephew was playing for Penn State hockey, and we went to a Wisconsin hockey game at, at home in Wisconsin here at the Kohl Center. And even though I had his name right here, Holtz, right here, so I could show all these Badger fans that were, I wasn't prepared for the looks that I was going to get or the attitude I was going to get and maybe some of the comments. I was just going to support, obviously, a family member. But uh, I'm, I'm a Wisconsin fan, but I was there supporting uh, my nephew that played for Penn State, but I was wearing the wrong thing. And so I got in there and everybody was giving me the dirtiest looks and people are talking about you and say, saying, like, what in the world is that guy wearing? And I kept on, look, 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 I got a family member in there. And then I've also had this strange dream and I wonder if it has anything to do about not being prepared. My whole life I've had this strange dream. Every once in a while it doesn't happen. It's periodic throughout the course of my life. But I have this thing where I have the wrong uniform on, or I don't have the right equipment. I don't have the proper equipment. And I'm always in the major league. So for those of you who don't know, I, I played in, played professional baseball, and I wasn't in the major leagues for very long. But I did make it there. So in these dreams, I'm always in the major leagues, but I'm always in this locker room. And I'm always looking for something. Where's my socks? I, I'm going to be up, I'm gonna be up to bat in like I'm, I'm on deck and I don't know where my socks are. I don't know where my jersey is. And then I get ready and I'm finally ready to go and I can't find my bat. And it's like, I just want you to think about the things that we prepare for and how we prepare for them and the battle that we're actually in, whether or not we recognize it. And that's really the thing that I want you to get today. Today, we're not going to break down all the different details. You're going to know what the armor of God is, but I'm going to take the next couple of weeks or Christine and I, Maybe we'll split it up, uh, but we're going we're gonna to go over each and every individual piece of the armor in detail. But today we're going to get an overview of what that means. And one of the most important things is whether or not you engage in the battle or not, you to realize as you walk out of here, you are in a spiritual battle. And I think some people, even when you say that, they just want to go, la, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't, I don't want to engage in that. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to do that. You, you actually don't have a choice. And we're going to see that in our, in our signature scripture today. And then the other thing you're going to realize is, once again, the Lord is showing us that we play a role in this. This isn't something that we can just know that there is an armor of God, and we're going to find out where that is. We're going to find out what those pieces are. 
But even that, that is just gonna be head knowledge. That has nothing to do with heart knowledge, it has nothing to do with putting it into action. So not only do we have a choice, but we're gonna find out that God has equipped us for this battle. That he didn't just equip us for the battle, but he actually equipped us for victory. Like that last song we were just singing, you're gonna see a victory. Do you actually believe that? Do you actually believe that? And if I asked you right now, are you walking in victory? And if you asked me on Monday morning when I was sulking at the, at the kitchen table, was I walking in victory? And you're gonna see that this isn't just a one-time decision to put on this armor of God, but he's actually equipped us for victory in this battle. For those of you that are in Christ and remain in Christ, I got a spoiler alert. The song already spoiled it too at the end. In the end, we win. I had so many people talk to me today about really, not today, this week, about really tough situations that they're going through. And I had to do this myself in my own life, and I continually have to do it, but I asked them, what if the Lord would show you the actual end result? Like you saw the end result, would you act completely different today if you saw in the end what's actually going to end up happening? If you stay strong and firm in your faith? And some of you might be going, well, that's pie in the sky, but you're going to see that's what we're asked to do here. And the Lord will give you victory in these things. We just don't know the timing of it. And so in the end, you win if you armor up. And that's the question, if you armor up. So where is this armor found? And what do we need to do to be armored up daily? Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, I'm going to read it all. The order is important. God is a God of order. Ephesians 6, 10, let's look what happens first. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You're going to hear stand a lot. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That person that you think is the thing that is the problem, that scenario, that situation, that job, that manager, whatever you're trying to put it on, that personality, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our enemy loves to get us focused on flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's talking about a spiritual battle. Therefore, what are we supposed to do? Put on the full armor of God, so when the day when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, after you've done all the things that you know to do, all your, my, all your power, still stand. So there must be some component of the enemy trying to keep on knocking you down. And you're having to stand back up. Or you're actually being able to stand firm while he's trying to knock you down. Stand firm then. It's verse 14. And this, this is the armor. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Which, with you, which, with, which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. All. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Now, might I submit to you, even as I read that, I think I was pretty alert last week, all week long, Holy Week. What, where's your mind at, especially as a pastor? Where's your mind that you're preparing all week for all the different services? You're pre preparing for all the different things that happen throughout that week, say throughout that week and to deliver that to the Lord's people so that people can understand truly what Jesus did for us and who he is in our lives. And so I was on alert. And then Monday, what happens? You let your guard down. You let yourself, you take off the armor and you start getting beat up. By the enemy. And the enemy loves that. And he sees how much he can steal from that momentum that you had the week before. And like I said, we're going to spend the next couple of weeks breaking down each piece of the armor so that we can truly know how to armor up individually those individual pieces. And we're going to learn about the protection and the victory that it offers. In Hosea 4, 6, it says, my people are destroyed or they suffer because of lack of knowledge. So we're not going to have that excuse anymore after a couple of weeks. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'm encouraging you, anybody that the Lord puts on your heart while I'm up here preaching today, anybody that the Lord puts on your heart, somebody that's really going through a, a battle right now, I want you to ask them to come to church and learn how to fight for victory. For the next, it, it may last six weeks. If we do one week, it may, it may last seven, it may last eight, or I might put a couple of them together. I'm not sure exactly how the Lord's going to put it together. But over the next couple of weeks, over the next couple of months, we're going to learn how to armor up and get victory in our life. We're going to learn how to fight in the spirit. And I think a lot of people in the body of Christ are taking this for granted. 
So we're going to go through the details, but before we do that, we're going to look at a few truths today about the armor of God, a few truths about the armor. Truth number one, the armor of God is suitable for all ages, and that's why I'm glad we have some young people in here today. The armor of God is suitable for all ages. I don't know if we have, yeah, we do. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, I just wonder, I just wonder if any of you feel like you look like this sitting out there right now. If any of you walk through that door thinking that you look like this, I just want to let you know, I, I actually see some people that I look, I see some people that look like this, but I'm not sure that you actually knew that you look like this, but I know we have some prayer warriors in here. I really, I know we have some strong faith. I know we have some believers in, in the word of God and, have, and I've done life with you and you have some tremendous testimonies of perseverance. And so I know that you look like this, but if you didn't, if you would forfeit yourself and say, uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't look like that. Maybe, maybe you think that uh, this doesn't describe you at all. Or maybe you think the armor of God is something that we could look up on Amazon and order it up, and we could order it up, and then that we'd be all good. If we, if we just showed up like that every day to work, and then you go, well, how am I going to get anything done? I mean, my arms are going to be occupied. It's going to be heavy. I don't even, I'm going to be concentrating on that all day. So maybe, maybe you think that. Or maybe you think the armor of God's only good when it's necessary. I'll wait till, you know, like all of us men do especially. I know we all do this, but men, we're, we're very uh, guilty of this. Uh, I'll wait till I'm at rock bottom. I'm gonna try and figure this thing out first. And then if it all doesn't work out, then maybe I'll try and figure out what this armor of God is. Okay, maybe we've had those type of thoughts. Not now, but back, back in the day, right? Back in the day. Without realizing that the armor of God is actually something that we live out every day. This is how you actually look in the spirit. So it has nothing to do with you looking in the mirror and seeing like I had to this morning that I'm maybe not as strong as I used to be. I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm not as athletic as I used to be. And, uh, and so I don't know if I saw that in the natural, but I certainly feel that in the spirit. What if one of the ways the enemy has neutralized the power of the army, armor of God is by convincing us that it doesn't fit us and that it must be for someone else? Because I couldn't look like that. I couldn't carry that weight. And you might say, I don't even know until you just said it this morning, what the armor of God was. Well, first of all, with that thought, you would be right. You, you can't. You can't carry the weight. You can't make yourself look like that in the spirit. You can't give yourself victory just because you know, even after today, where to find the armor of God. But God can. And he will give you the strength to be a warrior for his kingdom if you let him. This is what I love about God, and I'm not sure as Christians, I'm not sure this gets talked about enough. We talk about it all the time in here, but you have a choice. God doesn't force anything. God's not going to make you look like that, but you have a choice if you want to look like that. So we needed it when we were young, even though we didn't maybe realize it. And thank God for his grace, mercy, and protection, even though we didn't put it on. Amen to that. We needed it in our young adult stages, even though we may not have recognized it. And we need it no matter what age we are sitting out here today. Whether you consider yourself uh, further along on the spiritual maturity scale, or you're just getting started in this walk with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Every single one of us has the same opportunity to put it on every single day. The ar armor of God is suitable for all ages, and it's always, how about this, it was always available to you, and it always is available to you. That feels pretty good. Thank you, Lord. The real question we have to ask ourselves is, why wouldn't you put it on? Why wouldn't you put it on? Truth number two about the armor of God. The armor of God is essential for survival in this world, this temporary vapor world that we live in, this natural world outside of the spiritual realm. It's essential to live in this world. Look what it says in Ephesians 6. We already read that, but in 11 through 13. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So that, there's no secret there. The enemy has a scheme. The enemy has a plan. Okay? He's, he's being very clear right here. But you can take your stand. Nobody else. The pastor can't necessarily take the stand for you. He can take the stand with you, which we're going to learn about in a minute. And that's powerful. But he can't take the stand for you. So you have a choice in this thing. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, we talked about that, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, look, look again, you may be able to stand your ground. You, you, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, he asks us to stand again. So Paul doesn't say in Ephesians 6, 11, to put on the armor of God only if you're struggling with your faith, only if you're having a really bad day, then you might consider putting on the armor of God. If you go to your church and you pass a course in discipleship or alpha, or you finally decided to join that men's group on Thursday or Friday morning, or you start to come to the ladies' Bible study, or you start to get involved in some way at the church, then you're qualified to put on the armor of God. Or let's wait till I get cleaned up. I got, I got some things to work on. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. One of these days, I'm going to give that thing up, that addiction that's been holding me back for all these years. And when I do, then I'm going to be ready to put on the full armor of God, because now I can then represent the Lord in the way that I should. How about only if I'm called to ministry? And that's, that's the pastor's job. I've had people tell me that about the word of God. I say, do you believe in the word of God? Yes. Well, are, do you read it? No, that's your job to teach me that. Okay. Um, that is my call. That is my call. And I love to do that. And I will meet with anybody in here that, so that we can both grow in the things of the Lord. But it's all of our ministry to grow in the things of the Lord. And as you see, it was, this, this was specific to us. And then Paul doesn't say, as in Ephesians 6.13, he doesn't say if the day of evil comes or wait for the day of evil when you think it's coming. He says when, when the day of evil comes. So here's the thing. We're either going to be prepared or we're not. And it's up to us. And it's offered to you to be prepared for victory. And that's why it's essential for everyday living. Paul's trying to show us and tell us that whether or not you recognize it, whether or not you prepare or engage in the battle, there's a spiritual battle taking place. And the enemy has a clear plan and a scheme against you. And guess what that plan is? Again, this is not a secret. The enemy would like to kill, steal, and destroy. That is his plan. If you look at John 10.10, 10, it says the thief, the enemy, comes only to steal, kill, kill, and destroy. I have come, Jesus, that they may have life and have it to the full. So he's going to counteract that, and he way outweighs in every single area anything that the enemy has planned for our lives, if we allow ourselves to walk in his power. Think about the things that we suit up for. Think about the things that we make sure we're dressed properly for. Whether it be a soldier going to battle, could you imagine going out to war and we're watching on TV these uh, wars that are happening uh, all across the world and somebody runs out and he's got no weapons, he's not dressed in uniform at all, and he's out there in his, in his flip-flops and his tank top and, and acting like he's going to do something in war. That wouldn't make any sense to you, right? And we would be, we'd say, that man or that woman's in trouble. To be in that type of environment without the proper equipment. Think of police, firefighter, anything that you've done in your life where you've had EMS, doctors, athletes, all have uniforms, right? There's a preparation. There's something that you're going to use while you're performing whatever it is that, that you are using, your gifts and talents, or, or whatever your vocation is. And yet the most important battle of our lives is spiritual warfare, which is going on every single day, and we don't suit up and we don't armor up for it. A battle that the world tells us that we are, that the word, well, the world will tell you too in a different way, but the word tells us we're participating in daily. <clears throat> so when the day of evil comes, when the attack comes, when the spiritual battle is going on all around you or inside of you, if you try and do it on your own power and your own strength, then you will not be able to stand. That's why Paul tells us before we, put on the full, before we put on the armor of God, it says in 610, what did it say before we even talked about the armor of God? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So you get yourself out of the way immediately, and that's how you come to the Lord. Lord, I can't win this battle, I know that. But I know through Christ, through the power of Christ, to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, and if I'm willing to put on the armor of God, I know that eventually, in the end, you will give me victory. 
Truth number three about the armor of God. The armor of God is almost entirely defensive. Five out of the six pieces of armor for spiritual battle are defensive. And they have to do with protection for you. And I might submit, because we always seem to make it about ourselves, I might submit protection for those around you as well. As you armor up, protection for those around you, standing in the gap for others. So we have five pieces. We have six total, five pieces defensive, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet sandaled with the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. Now we're going to go through each one of those individually over the next couple of weeks, so we'll have a better understanding of what all of those things represent in our lives. But then we have one offensive piece of armor, and that's the sword of the Spirit. And it says that's the word of God. But I would submit to you that that's actually both offensive and defensive because it's a double-edged sword. As we read in Hebrews 4 and 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. So the Lord's, we're, we're clay on the potter's wheel. The Lord's cutting us up with his word. He's molding and shaping us, and then he's equipping us for victory. So that, that word of God is a double-edged sword, but it's the one thing that we can be offensive with, but it first cuts us as we read it. The oldest tactic in the book, the book, the oldest tactic the enemy uses is to get you and I to doubt the word of God. And some of you probably know where I'm going with this already, and we'll go quickly through it. I have preached on this in the past but it's important. And I would submit that even now, many of us doubt the word without even knowing what the word says. I have some great friends in my life and one of their comments recently, <clears throat> it was awesome. And sometimes this isn't, these aren't profound, like, wow, what a deep thought. This is just awesome when somebody comes to this revelation that we all can come to. They read the word and they're like, why am I not doing this? Why am I not doing this? Isn't that pretty simple? And that's probably a question. It's not to prove to Pastor Andy or your family or anybody else. It's between you and God. Why am I not doing this? That's really a huge question that we should ask. But right away in Genesis, Satan's oldest tactic is to try and get us to question the word of God. In Genesis, God creates the universe with his words. He speaks it into existence. He creates everything by speaking it. God first formed everything with his words. But then there's a moment in this narrative where everything changes. Because there's a moment when instead of speaking, it says God reaches down and formed man. There's something very special about man. God stopped breathing. I'm sorry. God stopped speaking. And he decided to form us, humans, out of the dust. The fact that man was created from dust makes him a unique being among all of God's creation. To create the sun, the mountains, the animal life, etc. God simply spoke. And we read over and over again. Then God said, and you can do that in Genesis. God said, God said, God said. And he was speaking it all into existence in Genesis 1. Human life, however, included the dust of the earth. And how about this? The very breath of God. The reason we're even breathing. That's pretty cool. We even take that for granted. The fact that we're even breathing. He, he breathed that breath into us. God could have chosen to create humans in any way he desired. However, Scripture records the particular way he did create us using both natural material, dust, and supernatural power to give humans a unique place in his universe. The recipe of dust of the earth and God's breath emphasizes the supernatural power of God and also the fragile nature of humanity, if you think about dust. <laughs> Talks about our life being a vapor, like you would have on the stove. And all of a sudden, that steam would just come. That's how, how long we're here. And then our bodies are made out of dust. We're so fragile. Human life, whether we acknowledge it or not, is completely dependent on God. And as a result, humans are called to worship the Lord and to serve him only. Then in Genesis chapter 3, this special place that God has in his heart for us gets all messed up. <laughs> Had the special place in his heart for us. And Adam, that darn Adam and Eve, they messed it up, right? The command was to Adam and Eve to enjoy all of God's creation except that one tree. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Isn't that our human nature? That if we say that you can't do that or you can't touch that or don't do that, but you can have all this, the only thing we'll be thinking about is, I wonder why I can't do that. 
or what does that mean if I do that? What's going to happen if I do that? But he said, enjoy all of God's creation except that one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat the fruit from that tree. And so what does Satan do? He asks Eve a question that changes the trajectory of history forever. Did God really say? And this is what we ask ourselves all the time. And then you know what we do? We form God into the way that we want God to be. We know a little bit of the word, and we're going to see how that fits into our lifestyle instead of really going deep and asking God how he wants us to live. And that's what Satan did right here. Did God really say that? And his tactic is to get you to question the word of God. And then watch what Eve does. Eve says, yes, God said we should not eat from it, but then she adds something to it, and it says, or even touch it. So there's, here we got the first miscommunication. Uh, Adam must have been uh, the communicator for the Lord, and he was supposed to pass on to Eve what the actual commandment was, and he messed it up. And then we, the Bible says you shouldn't add anything or take anything away from the word. And here she did add something to it. It says that we shouldn't even touch it. So Eve in that moment misquotes God. She gets it wrong. And then somehow Satan convinces her and Adam, for that matter, that in the command that God gave them, that he was actually holding something back from them instead of trying to protect them. And we still do that today. We believe that lie that God is trying to restrict us. He's trying to take something away from us instead of that God's trying to always get something to us. Instead of seeing that God is protecting us and has a better plan for our lives than this, anything that this world could ever offer, we act like he's trying to take something from us. And we don't realize that it's actually our fleshly desires that are craving those things. And so if we'll build up our spirit, man, we'll have a godly perspective of why the Lord didn't want us to do that or to live that way. We oftentimes believe the lie that God is taking something from us. We don't see it as God's constantly trying to get something to us over and over and over. When we talk about going from glory to glory to glory, if you got something from God yesterday, you're not good. I'm good for the week. I got it. You wake up this morning excited, saying, Lord, I need a deeper revelation from your word today. Would you speak to me through your Holy Spirit? And why don't we see it like everything else he's done? We just talked about the way that he created the earth. Why don't we see it that he has an order and a design to everything and a purpose, not only for you, but also here on earth? Today, you're hearing the word of God for you. Maybe you're hearing for the first time about the armor of God in Ephesians. Or maybe you know all about the armor of God, but just knowing about it doesn't put it into action. The word of God is our weapon. And it's the only way to fight back against the enemy and to get victory in our spiritual warfare that we're engaged in, whether we recognize it or not. Even our Lord and Savior showed us how to fight temptation. And I want you to go ahead and read this as you listen to this again online or you write it down. But you can look both accounts. Matthew 4 and Luke 4 are exactly the same. And you see that Jesus was being tempted by Satan. And what did he tempt him with? He tempted him with the word. And Jesus gives us the greatest example of all of how to respond to that. And he actually spoke the truth from the word, but he did it from the position of knowing God's heart. One, because he was God. And so that's our goal is to know God's heart in his word. Jesus fights back with the word of God correctly because he understands and knows God's heart. Here's a tough question that we each individually have to ask ourselves. Does Satan know the word of God better than we do? Does Satan know the word of God better than we do? And if the answer to that question is yes, then we face the battle of being deceived and allowing the enemy to lie to us daily and possibly get us to doubt like Adam and Eve did or question the word of God. We need to be ready to fight back with the word of God. If we knew the word, and had the word hidden in our heart like it's asked us, then it is possible that we would no longer be like that double-minded man that James talks about. Let's read that, and let's see if this has happened to us throughout the course of our lives. James 1, 2 through 8, <clears throat> and I wonder if we ever really do consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking and not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, 
you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Whoa. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> It will be given to you, hallelujah. Yes, it will. But when you ask, see, I got a loud voice. I'm all right. This is beautiful. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Here we are being tossed to and from. Such that person, it says in verse 8, is double-minded, and unstable in all they do. So many of us are marching into battle unarmed and without the proper uniform. No child of God needs to do that. And God not, did not intend you for you to fight these battles on your own. The final truth, by the way, just enjoy God's peace right now. This is awesome. It's awesome. It really is. The final truth, the armor of God is actually incomplete. And trust me, nothing is incomplete in the word. We're going to find out what that means. But we've been given this gift as the armor of God. And maybe with all the distractions taken away here, uh, you can actually receive this right now. I'm going to tell you what these gifts are. The belt of truth is to know Jesus. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Know his word and to live his word out in your life. That's the belt of truth. He's the truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Live like Jesus. Make right choices and resist temptation. The feet sandaled with the gospel of peace. To stand ready in faith, be at peace with God, and be at peace with others. And to share your faith. The shield of faith. To know and live the word of God. Act on your faith. Resist worry, fear, and doubt, and trust in the promises of God. How can we trust in something that we don't even know? How about the helmet of salvation? Understand who you were prior to salvation and show appreciation, gratitude, and thankfulness for God's grace. Meditate and marvel on God's love and holiness shown on what he did for you and I on the cross, like we learned about last week. And live in the assurance of Christ's return. And then how about that sword of the Spirit? Read, know, and live the Word of God, and then learn to speak to yourself and others of, the, of His good news. You may not have realized that there was something missing in this armor, and there's something incomplete. There's no piece of armor for your back. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this, Though one may be overpowered, Think about when you've isolated yourself and you've tried to figure it all out on your own. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. One of the reasons there is not an armor for the back is because you are supposed to have mine and I'm supposed to have yours. We as church rooted right are supposed to have each other's back. This is not an individual fight. It was never meant to be. In Deuteronomy 32.30, it says one could chase a 1,000, and then two could put 10,000 to flight. What does that mean? That means you doing your own work on your own and praying and getting God involved is amazing, and you can put a 1,000 to flight, but two could put 10,000. What about an army for Christ? This verse speaks to the power of divine support, suggesting that with God's help and with God's armor, even a small number can achieve great victories against overwhelming odds. And we're seeing that happen here in Rooted Right Ministries. God has given us great victory against overwhelming odds. And I'm seeing miracles, literal miracles happening in me and all around me. We have to learn to fight these battles, spiritual battles, both seen and unseen, together. And have we had power? You would see this picture of us all standing side by side with this shield of faith and what that looked like uh, as the Roman soldiers prepared for war. And they even had uh, these huge shields that they would hold out in front of them, but the front line would get down on their knees and get behind it for protection, and the back would uh, line up their shields on top, and they would get behind, and then that's how they would move forward. And in this formation, the soldiers were protected, 
and they could push back against the enemy and take new ground. This is a picture of what the Christian community should look like in the spirit. This is a picture of what your life and my life should look like. Too many of us are fighting and struggling alone, isolating, and then not being equipped for the battle. You're in a battle, whether you like it or not. Are you willing to learn how to fight and then how to fight together? Who can you identify in your life? Either men and women of God that are willing to fight with you and are willing to go to battle with you. Who has God placed in your life? And then this next part, which is tough. Are you courageous enough to let them know it and then commit to being there for each other in your spiritual battles? <clears throat> I know the men continually send out text messages when there's something going on that was unexpected, when there's a surgery coming up, when there's a battle that's going on in their family and relationships. And they'll send out, would you please pray for me? And I know many times men will stop everything that they're doing. They'll pull on the side of the road. They'll, they'll excuse themselves from a conversation and they'll go and they'll pray so that that man knows that he's not going through this thing by himself. This is a picture of what our Christian community should look like because there's a reality of how we're all impacting each other. If you put on the armor of God and I don't, I'm still impacted because I'm not protecting you. And if I'm, and I'm leaving you vulnerable to the attack of the enemy, and if I put on the armor of God and you don't, you're leaving me vulnerable to the enemy's attack. It's twofold this morning. We can talk about the armor of God, and you definitely need the armor of God, but you also need the people of God. To get the victory that God intended for all of us all along and actually equipped us, but many of us didn't even know it, maybe until this morning. But we've taken, about, we've taken away that American excuse card this morning. We need the armor of God, and we need the people of God. Let us pray. Father, you're such an awesome God. I, I, Lord, I love what you did there. <laughs> it, it's just such a picture of us always going, 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 going. There's stuff just happening all around us. There's, we, we just can't disengage very often from this crazy world. And even though we take time sometimes to hear your voice and to dive into your word, maybe at a church service or even some alone time, it seems like the distractions of this world just grab our attention. And Lord, we allow the enemy to steal so many times the new revelation that you've given us. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the armor of God. Father, we thank you that you fully equipped us to fight the battles, uh, the spiritual battles that many of us didn't even know that we're in. And many of us have been trying to take on on our own. Lord, we know the enemy isolates. We know the enemy has a plan and a scheme for us to kill, steal, and destroy the different areas of our lives. And so those areas that aren't growing, those areas that we are experiencing death, whether it be death of a relationship, a financial death, um, a, a job death, uh, it, it can be even a physical. Uh, Lord, we just come against that in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask that we would learn over the next several weeks how to armor up. We ask that we would not take for granted that you've given us uh, this formula. You've given us the armor. And Father, I know that you showed me, which I'm going to pray over right now. You showed me that there's six pieces of armor, and I want to get this in everybody's spirit. Six is a number of flesh. And so that is this world that we live in, the world flesh. We're fighting against this battle against the enemy in this world that we live in, and there's six pieces of armor. But we're going to learn at the end that the seventh piece is prayer. And so until we actually activate it in prayer, until we actually activate those pieces, we can put those things on all day long, but until we're willing to humble ourselves and pray, until we're willing to be a house of prayer, at church rooted right. Uh, Lord, we're not going to see the victory that you always intended for us. And so that seven is a number of completion. That number seven is a number of completion. And so for you to complete the perfect will of God in our lives, it must be activated, this armor of God through prayer. And then Lord, because I love numbers and I know that eight means new beginnings, if we're actually willing to put on the armor of God, those six pieces and we're actually willing to wrap it in prayer, not just with ourselves, but with other like-minded believers, Lord, we finally get to that eighth, that number eight, where there's new beginnings in our lives, and we're starting to see things 
all the things that you've intended for us all along. And we're starting to walk in the perfect will of God, not just individually, but also corporately.